Welcome to the video for chapter 17 of the Cambridge Introduction to Sanskrit, which is going to tell you more about noun formation. In chapter 14, we looked at the process of creating new nouns by taking two or more nouns and putting them together into a new so-called compound noun. Here we are going to look at the process of creating new nouns or adjectives on the basis of other words or word forms that is also known as derivation. Examples of words formed by means of word derivation in English would be words such as entertainer and entertainment from the basis of to entertain. Sanskrit noun formation of this kind usually works by adding a suffix to either a verbal root and this verbal root can stand in any of the three vowel grades, but guna is the most common, or by means of adding a suffix to another noun, and the first vowel of this noun may be put into its root grade. We'll see examples of both of these processes throughout this chapter. We are going to be looking at this because knowledge of these processes helps you recognize many more Sanskrit words than you have memorized and therefore greatly expands your Sanskrit vocabulary. And our focus here is going to be on nouns and adjectives that are created with the most frequent short a and long a stem suffixes. The most basic suffix to add is short a. What you do is you take a verbal root, usually in guna, but sometimes you also find virti and you add an a to it. And the result is either a noun or an adjective whose meaning will be based on the meaning of that verbal root. So, for example, from wid, meaning to see or to know, we get weda, meaning knowledge. What you need to do is take that root, wid, put its vowel into guna, giving you weid, and add a, and you get weda. From snich to love, we get sneha, meaning love, the noun, love. And again, you get the root, you put its vowel into guna. From snich, we get snech, and then we add a, and so we arrive at the word sneha. On the basis of bud, to wake up or to understand, we get both the noun buddha, meaning consciousness, and the adjective buddha, meaning knowing or understanding. On the basis of hirsch, to be excited, to be happy, we get again both the noun excitement and the adjective exciting, both harsha. And on the basis of her, to take, we get both hara and hara, so adjectives that employ the guna and the virti of the root her. Hara would be guna, hara would be vritti, and these adjectives both mean bearing, wearing, carrying, and so on. These are just a few examples out of the many, many that you will find across Sanskrit. Anna is another suffix that would be added to verbal roots in guna, and uh, what it does is that it forms adjectives or nouns, similar to what English ing or ing does. So, for example, for much, to release or to free, we get the adjective mochana, meaning releasing or freeing, as well as the noun mochana, meaning the act of releasing or release. On the basis of what, to speak, we get both a noun wachana, the act of speaking, a word or speech, and the adjective wachana, meaning talking or speaking. On the basis of shub, to adorn or to adorn oneself, we get the adjective shobhana, meaning pleasing, pleasant or beautiful. Sometimes adding ana also results in concrete nouns. So, for example, from loch to see, we get the noun lochana, meaning I. Nouns formed by the addition of ana are practically always neuter. And adjectives ending in, uh, ending in ana are not always, but often, the final member of a compound. Up next is tra, which is also added to verbal roots in guna, but actually creates nouns with a rather specific and mostly predictable meaning. Namely, it creates instrument nouns, i.e. nouns that refer to instruments for doing the thing that the verbal root refers to. So, for example, on the basis of the verbal root shas, to command or to instruct, we get a noun shastra, which means literally an instrument for instructing and therefore can be used to mean textbook, any kind of teaching, scripture, and so on. On the basis of shas, which means to cut, we get shastra, meaning 
a cutting instrument and therefore a knife a sword a dagger and so on man to think gives us mantra which literally is an instrument for thinking but is commonly used to mean a prayer or an incantation ni to lead gives us netra literally an instrument for leading which is used to mean the eye pat to fly gives us patra which is again literally an instrument for flying and is used to refer to a wing tra formations tra nouns are almost always neuter the next suffix twa is not added to verbal roots but it's added to nouns or adjectives and in its meaning it is loosely equivalent to the english suffixes nus dum or hood in words such as brotherhood childhood and so on so referring to the state of being brothers the state of being children and so on so for example we get naratwa which is being a nara i.e a man and therefore manhood or humanity devatwa would be being a dewa i.e de deity or divinity i.e the state of being a god gurutwa would be the state of being a teacher the quality of being a teacher teacherness and so on Twa derivatives on the basis of adjectives are best translated into English with the suffix ness. So, for example, from abudha, meaning foolish, we get abudha twa, foolishness. Twa formations, or rather nouns formed by means of adding twa, are neuter. Ta is a suffix that is very similar to twa in both its use and its meaning. It's added to either adjectives or to nouns, and it also forms abstracts. And there actually are several nouns um, and adjectives that use both toi and ta with very little distinction in meaning. So, for example, on the basis of priya, meaning dear, we get priya ta, dearness or being dear. Martya ta would be the state of being martya, i.e. mortal, and so therefore mortality. Mitra ta, state of being mitra, being friends, friendship. Purushata, state of being a purusha, so manhood or manliness. And we just saw dewa twa, here we have dewa ta, which once again has the double meaning of divinity and specifically a deity and therefore a god. Ta abstracts are of feminine gender. A different way of deriving new nouns and adjectives is by taking some other noun and putting its first vowel into vritti. And the meaning of the newly created word is belonging to the basic noun. So, for example, from pura, which means city, we get paura, which is created by taking pura and taking the vowel u, the first vowel in this word, u, and putting it into vritti. So from pu, we get pau and then paura and a paura is someone who belongs to a city and therefore a citizen if the basic word is not a short a stem then it was frequently turned into one and an already existing final a or a may also be replaced by ya so for example we get waidya meaning doctor or a learned person um, on the basis of weda which means knowledge and so we take weda we put the first vowel, e, into vritti, i, and in this word, the final a of weda is replaced by ya, and so we don't get waida, but waidya, and this is someone who belongs to or is well versed in weda. On the basis of sena, we get sainya, where again the first vowel is put into vritti, so from e we get i, and the final a is again replaced by ya, and so someone who belongs to a sena to an army would be a soldier on the basis of shura which means hero or strong man we get shaurya which means heroism or valor again we take the first vowel put it into vritti so on the basis of u we get au and again the a is replaced by ya and so from shura we get shaurya on the basis of mitra meaning friend we actually get a number of nouns that all mean friendship that which has to do with friends, and those would be Maitra, Maitriya, and Maitri. What these have in common is that all of them have the first vowel in Vritti, 
would happen to the end of the word is different in the case of mitra nothing has changed in the case of mitra ya the a has been replaced by ya and in the case of e the a has been replaced by a long e very often abstract nouns such as friendship are actually grammatically feminine and so this is just there to show that um, the process that we are looking at derivation by taking the first vowel and putting it into vritti always has the same semantic result, always results in the same kind of meaning. What happens at the end of the word that has been vertied can vary, but that doesn't have any influence on the meaning of the resulting word. Vritti derivatives specifically of place names refer to the inhabitants of these places. So, for example, in the story of Nala and Damayanti from the Ramayana, we have Nala often referred to as Naishadach, meaning the one from or belonging to Nishada. And um, Damayanti often referred to as Vaidarbhi, i.e. the one from Vidarbha. And note that Naishadach is masculine because it refers to a man and Vaidarbhi is feminine because it here refers to a woman, namely Damayanti. Vritti derivatives, not from place names, but from personal names, refer to the children or descendants of that person. So, for example, in the Mahabharata, we have the two opposing sides on the conflict, the sons of Kuru and the sons of Pandu, who are referred to as the Kauravah and the Pandavah. Notice that here we not only have the first vowel in Kauravah and Pandavah in Vritti, but also the U at the end of each name, Kuru and Pandu, has been changed so that we now have an A stem. It's not Kauru, but Kaurava. And notice furthermore that in Pandu, actually, the vowel already is in Vritti, so there is no way of strengthening it any further. And therefore, the only way of forming such a derivative that means son of Pandu or descendant of Pandu is not by strengthening this initial vowel any further, which isn't possible, but by changing the end of the word from U to Awa. And finally, a practical take on all of this. You may already have noticed that there is a lot of overlap between the use and the meaning of these various possible formations. So basically what you should do is when you encounter a formation that uses a or ana or ya or vritti or vritti in combination with one of these other things and you don't already know this word, then what you need to do is identify the verbal root or nominal stem that it is based on and then use its context to make an educated guess what this particular form means in this particular sentence. Is it an abstract? Does it refer to a process? Does it refer to the result of that process? And so on. If that still does not give you enough information to understand what that word means in that particular context, then look it up in a dictionary. That was it for this chapter. We hope that you found this video helpful. And if you have any comments or suggestions, we would love to hear from you. Please do write to us at ruppel at cambridge-sanskrit.org. And now, for your own work on this material, good luck and have fun!